Hello and welcome back everyone to another episode of Drew Crime. I'm your host Drew V and for this episode I will be covering the abduction and inhumane murder case of Molly Tibbetts. This case involves 20 year old Iowa University student Molly Tibbetts who was abducted while jogging on July 18, 2018 near Brooklyn, Iowa. Molly would end up missing for around four weeks before our main suspect in this case, an undocumented immigrant from Mexico, Christian Bahino Rivera, would admit to being involved and actually lead law enforcement to a nearby rural area cornfield where Molly's lifeless body would be discovered and confirmed deceased. This case has received a ton of national attention since 2018 and many people believe it even got to the point where right-wing politicians used Molly's death to help publicize the infamous Build the Wall campaign which was really at its height during this time. As this story unfolds, we learn that many divisions of law enforcement left no stone unturned trying to figure out who and why Molly was murdered. But in the end, it all came back to our suspect, Bahina Rivera. Bahina would be interviewed for several hours and then arrested on August 21, 2018, which led him to being charged for first-degree murder of Molly Tibbetts before going to trial in May of 2021. The trial lasted less than two weeks, and in the end, Bahina would be found guilty of Molly's murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Bahina's confession to the involvement of Molly's murder would ultimately be his demise in this case, and even though most of the evidence in this case does point his way, I really start to speculate there might be a lot more that was going on in this story that most people don't realize. In this episode, I want to talk about who Molly Tibbetts was, and then I'll get into the case leading up to Behina's guilty verdict, while also sharing Behina's side of the story, and then I'd like to finish this episode out by discussing other speculated possibilities to Molly's murder, including my thoughts and opinions on this case. So please join me on the rest of this episode as I try to make sense of both sides of the story, and really try to figure out if Behina Rivera is in fact a cold-blooded murderer, or an innocent man who was set up and led into a false confession. This is Drew Crime, Episode 10, Molly Tibbetts. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's, not, it's far more than 35. A lot of people, when something traumatic happens to them, they suppress it immediately. I kept those memories because I knew that I was the only person that was going to be able to tell them what happened when we got to the hospital. And when I got there, the first thing I said was, call the doctor. Second thing was the blood type. Third thing was, call the cops because they've got to, they've got to find him. Well, that was part of my, uh, I guess, my what you call fantasy. These people were uh, selected. You were engaged in some kind of fantasy during this period of time? Uh, yes, sir. Now, before we get into this case, I have to keep giving shout outs and thank yous to everyone who continues to tune into my podcast, TikTok, and YouTube channel. Some of my viewers have left some very uplifting comments on my YouTube channel, and it really does mean a lot to me and keeps me very motivated in continuing to grow this podcast. So a huge thanks to all of you that continue to support what I'm doing. If you are someone who is new to my podcast, I can be found on many different platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and many more. My YouTube videos I create always follow the publication of my podcast episodes, and this is really to give you a better idea of what cases I cover, thus providing pictures of people involved, maps I create, and ultimately just trying to give you a better true crime experience. Also, I can be reached at my podcast email, drewcrimepodcast at gmail.com. So if you have any questions, concerns, or would just like to discuss a case further, please feel free to reach out. All of the information from my research from the episode comes from most of the trial videos published by Law & Crime Network on YouTube, a few court documents, and articles from local and national media. Anyone other than Behina that I speak about in this episode is innocent of any crimes relating to Molly's murder and are only considered persons of interest. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get right into Molly's story. Molly Cecilia Tibbetts was born on May 8, 1998 in San Francisco, California to Rob Tibbetts and Laura Tibbetts. When she was in the second grade, her parents divorced and she moved to Iowa with her mother and two siblings. 
Her father kept a close relationship with the children, and he last saw Molly at his wedding in June of 2018, just a month before she would disappear. At the time of her disappearance, she was a resident of Brooklyn, Iowa, a small town about 70 miles east of Des Moines, and Molly was a psychology major at the University of Iowa. She worked at a children's day camp at Grinnell Regional Medical Center and was preparing for her sophomore year in college when she disappeared. Molly was said by many to be a bright and ambitious young woman who had a bright future ahead of her. She had a passion for running and often went on long jogs throughout the countryside around her hometown. From what I understand, Molly was kind, funny, goofy, and was also very much liked by everyone that knew her. Molly had also had a pretty serious relationship around three years with a guy named Dalton Jack that she had known since she had arrived in Brooklyn, and you'll definitely be hearing more about Dalton throughout the course of this episode. Now to start Molly's story, I'm going to begin in the evening of Wednesday, July 18th, 2018, when Molly sent Dalton a Snapchat picture of her inside the home where she and Dalton were living at. Molly at the time was living with her boyfriend Dalton, his brother Blake, and Blake's now wife, Allie, at Blake's house located at 622 West Des Moines Street. Molly then decides to leave the home and go for an evening jog around 7.45 p.m. She leaves the residence that night, jogging on one of her routes that she normally took, but on this particular night, she would disappear and never return home. Molly was the only one of them that was home that evening before she left. Dalton was in Dubuque, Iowa on a construction job assignment with Jasper Construction, and Blake said he was working in Newtown, and then after work was done, he was staying with Allie in Ames, Iowa, where she was also on a work assignment as well. Dalton also texted Molly around 8.18 p.m. that night stating, My phone data straight up won't work, which I will bring up again later in this episode. So the following day approaches Thursday the 19th, and Molly's co-workers notice Molly did not show up for work, so they end up calling Dalton to see if he knew about Molly's whereabouts, which he said he did not. So Dalton then calls his brother Blake around 4.30 p.m. and asks Blake if he had seen or talked to Molly that day, but he also did not know anything about Molly's whereabouts as well. Blake then drives back towards his residence around 6 p.m. and this is where two of Molly's friends would see and approach Blake and ask him if he had seen or heard from Molly. Since Blake did not know, he and her friends started to call, text, and Snapchat Molly's phone, but there was no response. So after brainstorming and coming up with nothing, they decided to call the police. Blake also had stated later in court that Molly always had her phone on her and he agreed she did not have a history of just going off the radar. Now, just a few hours later, around 9 p.m., Dalton arrives back to their house from Dubuque to find friends and local sheriff William Simpson gathered in their front lawn, taking people's statements. And after that, Dalton says he and Blake drove around all night searching for Molly, but again, came up with nothing. Also, I find it somewhat interesting that Sheriff Simpson was the first person contacted regarding Molly's disappearance, but ended up not having any involvement with this case after his initial response and investigation. Then after that day, he later went out of town, and for some reason he was never put back on this case. Simpson also searched Blake's residence, but nothing was taken for evidentiary value. So the following day on the 20th, Dalton and Blake were interviewed by police, but no new information came about from this interview, so the mystery surrounding Molly's disappearance continued on. Dalton would be interviewed again a few days later, again by law enforcement, as was his brother Blake, but again, no suspicions towards the brothers arose at the time. Now, in the meantime, many people, including friends, family, and law enforcement, continued their search efforts for Molly, but once again, there was no progress in tracing her possible whereabouts. Molly's disappearance had already hit the mainstream news, and Molly's dad, who lived in California, had arrived in Brooklyn to help with the search. Real quick, I just wanted to point out, when I just said mainstream news, I mean Molly's disappearance was being talked about by every local and major national news station across the country, and the awareness being brought to her disappearance was substantial. And I'm sure that most of you tuning into this episode have most likely heard something about this case in the past four years. Now, fast forwarding about three weeks to August 15, 2018, local law enforcement and other agencies had all been checking any surveillance they could find in the Brooklyn area in hopes of finding some information to try and connect to Molly's disappearance. And on this particular day, they said they would find just that. Law enforcement will learn of some of Molly's running routes from Dalton, and this is how they stumbled across some surveillance footage from a resident by the name of Logan Collins. 
After seizing Cullen's surveillance system, which he was completely cooperative and had not even looked at the footage, law enforcement then noticed someone who looked like to be jogging in the background of the footage. But what they also noticed was a black Chevy Malibu circling and lingering in the area as well. And this black Malibu would end up becoming the key into furthering this investigation. So on the following day on the 16th, Powashik Deputy Sheriff Steve Keeby was patrolling and he came across a black Chevy Malibu driving around the Brooklyn area, so he stopped the driver to question him. After questioning the driver about who he was and where he worked, this is where law enforcement would first learn about our only suspect in this case, Christian Bahina Rivera. Now, I'm just going to stop the story here and talk for a brief moment about who Bahina was in this story. At the time of Molly's murder, 24-year-old Christian Bahina Rivera was an undocumented immigrant who knew very little English and came to the States from Mexico in 2012. In 2014, Bahina was hired by a dairy farm, Yarabee Farms, which was located just outside the Brooklyn area. And this is also where Bahina lived in a trailer on the property that was provided by the owner, Craig Lang. It's been said that Bahina was someone who always got his work done on time, never had any complaints about him, was never angry, and was a pretty quiet guy. Bahina received his paychecks under the name John Budd, which according to the owners had been verified through Social Security and they thought his papers were legit. In 2015, Bahina and his girlfriend at the time, Iris Moneris, gave birth to their daughter, but the two would eventually separate later on in 2016. And from what I understand, Bahina was a good father and made time for his daughter. By 2018, Bahina had been in the States for about seven years and lived in Brooklyn for about four. Now getting back to our story, Bahina had been spoken to by Deputy Kivi, and then four days later on August 20th is when around 25 officers from local, the FBI, and Homeland Security came to Bahina's place of employment and wanted to talk with him. And they eventually took him down to the sheriff's station to interview him, which Bahina did voluntarily agree to do with no constraints. Bahina arrived at the sheriff's station around 3.30 p.m. that day, but what Bahina didn't know at the time was this would be the last time he would ever be a free man. Law enforcement brought in Spanish-speaking Paulo Romero from the West Liberty Police Department to help interpret the interview, which I do have to point out at the time, Romero only had 16 hours of interrogation training at the time, and this entire interview was spoken in Spanish. She and two other non-Spanish-speaking law enforcement officials continued to ask Bahina about his whereabouts on July 18th, plus pressing Bahina to help himself. And this interview would end up being around eight and a half hours, and Bahina was held at the station for around 11 hours in total. I do have to point out here that Romero told Bahina early on in the interview that he could leave at any time until they put a detainer on him around 11.30 p.m. for immigration purposes. At this point in time, Bahina's Miranda rights were read to him, which he waived, and during this interview, Bahina had made admissions to his involvement in Molly's murder such as it was him in the Malibu caught on call and surveillance, Molly's body at one point was in the trunk of his car, Bahina admitted to moving Molly's body from the trunk to a cornfield where he covered her body with corn stalks, and then after all of this, he would ultimately lead law enforcement to Molly Tibbetts' body. I do have to also point out here that Bahina said he blacked out at some point in his involvement, and he doesn't remember how Molly Tibbetts' body got into the back of his trunk, which I will bring up again here very shortly. Also, during the time that Bahina was being interviewed, law enforcement did search Bahina's Malibu for evidence, but on this initial search, nothing such as Molly's blood was found until they searched the vehicle again a few days later on the 22nd. And when the crime lab technician in court was asked why they didn't find Molly's blood around the trunk of the car for the first time it was examined, her answer was, it must have been overlooked. So after Bahina led Romero and other law enforcement to Molly's body, Bahina would be arrested and charged for first-degree murder of Molly Tibbetts on August 21, 2018. When Molly's body was found, she was severely decomposed and had numerous stab wounds to her torso area and one to both her head and her hand. Her shorts were pulled down, her sports bra had been pulled up, and her body had been in that cornfield for almost a month by this point. So after Bahina confessed to the involvement in Molly's murder, he later on in September pleaded not guilty to Molly's murder. So then a criminal trial date would be set for May 17, 2021 due to delays in COVID. And after 11 days on May 28, 2021, the jury would find and convict Bahina guilty of first-degree murder of Molly Tibbetts. 
And then on August 30th, 2021, Behina was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, this is where I will conclude the story from the state's perspective that was used in Behina's trial. And now I would like to get into Behina's side of the story, which was a complete bombshell that was dropped during the course of his trial. Behina took the stand and was represented by a married couple, Chad and Jennifer Freeze in this case. And in trial, Behina claims that his boss on the farm came and got him when law enforcement arrived on August 20th, saying there must be some trouble for him. But Behina says he didn't tell law enforcement everything about what happened with Molly that day. Behina claims he got home on July 18th after work and wanted to clean his car because he had a date the next night. Before that, he went to his uncle's to get a vacuum, which he called to tell him he took it, but when he got back to his trailer, it was too hot to vacuum around 6, 6.30 p.m. So, instead, Behina says he got back home, he took a shower, and then when he came out of the bathroom, there were two masked men dressed in dark clothing standing in his living room. One of the men was a bigger guy, and the other guy was his size and a little bit burly. The bigger guy was carrying a gun, and the smaller guy had a knife. And the gun was black, and the medium-sized knife had a camouflage color handle, and they then told Behina don't do anything stupid, and everything was going to be okay. Behina says that they were there for a long while, and the two men were whispering things to one another. They were not aggressive towards Behina, and he complied with their instructions, asking him to leave the trailer with them. Then Behina says they got into his Malibu, the bigger guy got into the back seat, and the smaller guy into the front seat. They then told him to drive straight, and he heard the men say something about someone running. Again, Behina couldn't speak English fluently, but he did understand basic English at the time. Then Behina says that he and the two men drove into Brooklyn using the back way and saw Molly Tibbetts jogging. Molly was jogging in the direction out of town and they were driving the direction into town before he was then told to turn around once they reached Brooklyn. The three men then came back out the same way they came into town and while they were doing this the two men started to slouch down in their seats in an attempt of not being seen. Behina then says they drove by Molly three or four times, which was instructed by the two men, and the last time they saw her, she was running back towards town on 385th Street while they were driving away from town. And then they would turn back around again around the intersection of 385th and 200th Street. I will have map exhibits used in trial on my YouTube video so you have a better understanding of what all this looked like. Then Behina was instructed to keep driving and then was told to stop by the man in the front seat. And according to Behina, Molly was not in sight at this point. After he was directed to stop by the man in the front seat, the man then got out of the vehicle and went towards town and was gone for right around 10 to 12 minutes. While this was happening, the gentleman in the back seat was sitting quietly and whispering to himself, and this is when Behina says he heard the man say, Come on, Jack which happens to be the last name of Molly's boyfriend and his brother. Behina couldn't confirm who these guys were and couldn't confirm it was Dalton Jack either. Then the smaller guy came back to the vehicle where they were stopped and instructed Rivera to continue to drive towards town where they would stop again after 300 meters. Behina was then instructed by the men to hand him his keys and they both got out of the vehicle and opened the trunk. Rivera says he then heard movement in the trunk and then the trunk would close. The two men then got back into the vehicle, turned the car back on, and asked Rivera to turn around again. The three proceeded down a gravel road driving very fast with no stopping for several miles until they crossed a paved road still on the gravel road. Rivera said they drove anywhere between five to eight minutes until they arrived in front of a white house. After turning into this house, Behina then said he was told to drive back and turn into an entrance of a cornfield. Behina did not know where he was at the time and he was then asked to turn the car off and they took his keys and his cell phone. Then this is where the two men told Behina not to say anything and that they knew his ex-girlfriend Iris and who his daughter were and if he were to say anything to anyone, they would take care of them. The two masked men then told Behina to wait a few minutes and then leave but at this point he didn't have his keys or phone. After waiting a few minutes, Behina then got out of the car and opened the trunk, and this is where he would discover Molly's body. After Behina opened the trunk, he noticed Molly was still moving, and then nothing. He stood there for a couple minutes and then proceeded to take the body out of the trunk, because by this point he was too scared to call the police. 
From the look of Molly's condition, Behina didn't think she was able to be saved. Her body was heavy, she was wearing sports clothing, and this is when he decided to put Molly's body into the cornfield and cover her with corn stalks and leaves, saying that he wanted her out of the exposure of the sun. At this point, her shorts and sports bra were still on, and one of her shoes had fallen off as well. Mahina also found in the trunk Molly's phone, Fitbit, and earbuds that were also along with his keys and phone. Then Mahina tried to go home by looking at his phone with directions, and in the process, left Molly's belongings on the side of the road. Then Behina goes on to say he held on to this secret for over a month, and if he was ever approached by law enforcement, he would most likely have never said anything because he was too afraid to become involved, and more importantly, he was worried about the safety of his family. So now we have two versions of Behina's story from July 18th. The first one was given to us by law enforcement in the state district attorney, and the second one I just said came from Behina. But the questions here are, which one is true, and who are we supposed to believe? Well, I think it's a pretty popular belief and opinion that because Bahina confessed to being involved in Molly's murder, he in fact must be guilty of this crime. But if you take away his confession in this case, the evidence that was presented in trial doesn't really add up to cast beyond reasonable doubt that he did this on his own, in my opinion. Even though Bahina's version of the story is pretty wild and out there, it doesn't make it impossible that it did in fact happen that way. Mahina's defense team, the Freezes, made some very good points in court as to why Bahina may have not been entirely guilty of this crime, and I will list a few here for you. In this case, the murder weapon was never found. Bahina never admitted to stabbing Molly at any point. There's zero video evidence of tracing Bahina's steps while taking law enforcement to the location of Molly's body. Law enforcement found hairs in Bahina's car, but they were never tested. There was very minimal blood that was found in and around her trunk, which makes me start to speculate she may have been stabbed later on, after she had been attacked and Behina placed her in the cornfield. The state never really established a primary crime scene. There's zero motive as to why Behina would just go and take Molly's life, when there were other people that could have had some type of motive, and there was other person's DNA mixed with Molly's in the trunk that was never even looked at. Now, to be fair, there's a lot of evidence in this case that does point Bahina's way, including a confession, but if you look into the case, you can really start to see there were quite a few other alternatives that should have been explored much further, but on here I'm only going to talk about two of them, which I will share next, and then I will conclude this episode. So after watching much of the trial that was shown on YouTube by the Law and Crime Network, I started to look in other directions other than Bahina, and the one person that really stuck out to me was Molly's boyfriend at the time, Dalton Jack. Now, before I start talking about Dalton, I do want to reiterate that Dalton is an innocent man when it comes to this case, and there's never been anything that confirms he was somehow involved in Molly's murder. But in my opinion, his actions surrounding the time Molly went missing were very strange, and his demeanor and the way he answers questions at court were very unexpected. And here I will play some clips from Dalton's testimony that he used in Behina's trial. Anything I do say about Dalton comes from circumstantial evidence that has led into pure speculation. And I will put the links to Dalton's trial videos in the episode description box for anyone who might be interested in what he had or didn't have to say. Defense be cross-examined. How long is it, again, since you've been in the Army? I've been in the Army for almost three years now. Okay, what was the date you uh, joined? November 6, 2018. So, three months after Molly's uh, discovery, right? Correct. Uh, so, did you ever go back to Jasper Construction to work? Yes. What was the decision to go to the Army based upon? I wanted to pretty much leave for a while. Why? Because I grew up there, she grew up there where we kind of built our relationship and now she was gone so you were heartbroken yes molly was your your true love mm -hmm. right i would say so yes you had planned on marrying this woman right yes and um, you were devoted to to molly right yes this people described it as a true love story right yes is that how you felt about her yes okay if i understand you correctly 
your testimony today is that on the night of Molly's disappearance, you were in your hotel room for a bit and then hanging out with the boys, drinking beers, playing games, right? Correct. And that's your testimony today, correct? Yes. We're clear on that? Yes. That's not always the story you've given to the police, though, is it? I don't know. <laughs> well, did you not tell the police in a previous interview that you spent the night in your room watching movies? That was what I was, yes. Now, you told Deputy Simpson that nothing really seemed to be out of place. Do you recall saying that? I don't recall saying that, but I could imagine that I did say that, yes. Okay. Have you reviewed any recordings or any reports relating to Deputy Simpson? I reviewed the report, yes. Okay. If Deputy Simpson's report says that's what you said, would you quibble with that? No. Okay. Now, do you recall having a conversation with Deputy Simpson saying that the bed was tousled and unmade? which was ironic since Molly was the last one in it. Again, I don't recall that. Okay. But if Deputy Simpson says that, would you uh, doubt that you made that statement? No. Okay. Um, and then you talked with Detective Steve Kivy of the Powasheet County Sheriff's Office, I believe the next day, right? Mm, yes. Do you recall that conversation? I don't recall every detail of that conversation, no. Okay, do you recall telling him what you were doing in Dubuque the night before? No. But you do recall, because you re um, your recollection has been refreshed by Mr. Brown, that uh, on the 23rd, or strike that, on the 18th you got a, a Snapchat from uh, Molly and you opened it around 10.30 p.m., right? Yes. Okay. You also told someone that the last time someone saw Molly was around 10.30 p.m. that night as well, right? I don't recall that. You don't recall saying that to someone? No. Do you recall telling police officers that you also went to bed both nights while you were in Dubuque around 10.30? I don't recall that either. Okay. I don't recall who that is. Okay. You recall telling the agents that on the 18th of July, the night that you say Molly uh, or Molly, we know Molly disappeared and that you were uh, in Dubuque, uh, that you finished work around 6.30 p.m. you recall telling them that on the 27th? No. Do you recall telling the agents that you showered and that night you watched Rush Hour 1 in your room? Is this the night of the 18th? Yes. Then yes. Now your te testimony today is that you were out with the boys playing games and drinking beers, right? Yes. So you told the officers on the 27th of July a different story, right? I suppose so. And if I showed you the report, would it refresh your recollection? Yes. You also told officers on that same interview information that you withheld before, right? Correct. And that information that you withheld before was that you'd had a relationship with a woman other than Molly, right? Correct. Who was that woman? Her name was Jordan Lamb. Okay. What did you tell officers the reason you withheld that information? I didn't deem it necessary. Would you agree with me that uh, you probably knew Molly's running, running routes better than anyone? No. Who would know better? I don't know who would know better, but I barely knew Molly's running routes. Well, you testified on direct that you, you knew her run, running routes. I do know her running routes, yes. But now it's just you barely knew her running routes. I didn't know that she ran out to the blacktop. Do you recall texting with her around dinner time? No. She didn't ask you if you had a better day today? I don't recall that, no. So this is the day your love of your life goes missing, and you don't recall that? No. Did you not go back and try to recreate the day that your love of your life goes missing in an attempt to maybe figure out how she was uh, wound up missing? From the moment that it started, I knew that I was not a investigator of any sort. Okay, but even for your own peace of mind, you didn't go back and try to recreate this? My own peace of mind came by trying to get her back. Okay, did you not go back and look at your phone and look at your 
text messages and your Snapchats to just kind of rehash the days leading up to this? No. Not once? No. Okay. Understanding of the time of day on the 18th that Molly was likely abducted. Her normal running time was what I assumed. Okay, so no one's told you, you haven't done any investigation as to what time of day Molly was abducted. Exactly. Every detail of the case I've wanted omitted from me because I don't want to know. You don't want to know? No. Okay. And you don't recall texting Molly at 8, 18 or 8, 19 that night? No, I don't. You don't recall sending her a text message saying my phone data straight up won't work? No, I don't. Okay. And it's your testimony that you opened a Snapchat from Molly at 10.30 p.m., right? Yes. Would you agree with me that the Snapchat records that were retrieved by investigators would more accurately show those times than your recollection? Absolutely. Can you think of any reason in your mind why those records would show that you opened those that last snapchat at 1 30 a.m. on the 19th I was just awake woke up in the middle of the night okay so if they show 1 30 a.m. that's accurate right if that's what the records show yes okay so your recollection of that could be faulty yes you have no recollection of texting Molly at 8.18 p.m. on July 18th saying my data straight up won't work. I don't. The last message you sent your girlfriend on the day she was abducted. Now, like I said earlier in the episode, Dalton Jack dated Molly for about three years before she passed. He had even said in court that before she passed, he planned on marrying her and agreed with attorneys that she was the love of his life. But after hearing his testimony, I'm not quite sure if he was being completely truthful by not being able to recall much, and I don't believe his feelings for her were as strong as they were portrayed. So I'm just going to list some reasons as to why I came to this conclusion. Reason 1. Dalton changed his story a couple times when asked what he was doing after work on July 18, 2018. Remember, he was in Dubuque on a construction job, and Dubuque was right around two hours away from Brooklyn. Early on in this case, Dalton tells law enforcement that he went to work from 5.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and he got back to the hotel his crew was staying at while on the job. He then took a shower and then watched the movie Rush Hour before going to bed around 10.30 p.m. But his other story later on, he says he got off work, he grilled out and drank beers with the rest of the crew before going to bed at 10.30 p.m. because they worked early on while they were in Dubuque, and this story was confirmed by his boss at the time, Nick Wilson, who did testify in Behena's trial. So my question here is, why can't he seem to remember what he was actually doing the night the love of his life disappeared? Reason 2 before Molly disappeared, Dalton was caught talking and messing around with two other girls during the time he was with Molly, and it seems that Molly knew of this, but for some reason, Dalton couldn't recall much about this during the trial. Reason 3. Another girl, Emily Fenner, that Molly worked with at the time, texted Dalton when Molly didn't show up for work on the 19th and asked, quote-unquote, is Molly alive? which in my opinion is a very strange thing to ask someone's boyfriend who clearly was having issues in his relationship. Reason 4 Dalton was on his Find My iPhone app on the 18th the night Molly disappeared and he also used Apple Maps around 10pm that night as well. Now to be fair on this one, Dalton was in Dubuque on this night so it would make sense he didn't know where he was going. But both stories he has told say nothing about him leaving the hotel to go anywhere that night. And also, there were no tower records of Dalton's phone ever looked at to exculpate his whereabouts besides by his testimony from his boss. Reason 5 Dalton told law enforcement that he opened Molly's Snapchat she had sent before her jog on the 18th around 10.30pm. But records prove this not to be true and he actually opened it at 1.30am on the 19th. I found this to be a little odd being that he supposedly was in bed around 10.30pm the night Molly disappeared. Reason 6 
Like I had mentioned before in the episode, Dalton texted Molly at 8.18 p.m. and said that his phone data straight up won't work. And then by 8.20 p.m., Molly was in a trunk traveling at high speed away from Brooklyn. And both of these times were confirmed by Molly's phone. Now, to be fair on this one, it could certainly be pure coincidence that all of this was going on at the same time, but in my opinion, it seems very interesting that it did. Reason 7. Dalton was asked in court how many times he called Molly the following day on the 19th after she went missing, and I believe his answer was 10 times. Well, turns out he only called her once that day. Again, this is Dalton's love of his life, and he only called her once to see if she was okay or where she was. Last reason. Dalton and his brother were avid hunters, and they did have a hanging shelf case filled with numerous hunting knives and a loaded 357 revolver, but law enforcement never examined the case that could have possibly held some evidentiary value. Blake even said in his testimony during trial that it was common for them to field dress an animal after a kill and we know that Molly had been stabbed numerous times. Not saying that any one of the Daltons stabbed Molly by any means, but it's something that definitely should have been looked at closer, and once again, it was something in this case that was overlooked by law enforcement. In conclusion to Dalton, I speculate there are plenty of reasons here why he should have been more of a person of interest, but the state had even said in trial that they looked at him pretty hard and they couldn't find anything that connects him to Molly's disappearance or murder. But in my opinion, I don't think he was looked at as much as they're saying, and I don't think that they did enough to completely exculpate him in this case. Again, Dalton Jack is innocent of any crimes in this case, and everything that was just said is based on pure speculation that comes from circumstantial evidence presented in this case during trial. The second possible alternative besides Bahina and Dalton that I wanted to touch on really quick were the rumors of sex trafficking occurring in the area. There was an inmate by the name of Arnold Mackey that says another inmate he was serving time with named Gavin Jones admitted he was responsible for the murder of Molly Tibbetts and that Molly's murder was the result of sex trafficking that had gone wrong and that Bahina had been set up to take the fall. Also, an ex-girlfriend of Gavin Jones, too, claimed that Jones told her the same exact thing. Now, I agree with the state on this that there are a lot of holes in this story, and it doesn't really seem to add up. So, I will have the link to the video of Mackie's testimony in the episode description box. And I do think it is worth a listen, but only because there is sex trafficking that does occur often and all over the world. And if you also look at the amount of women that have gone missing in Iowa over the years, it does become a little bit concerning. In conclusion to this episode, this case was a very hard case to cover, especially since Behina confessed to being involved during Molly's murder. But in the end, if you do take out Behina's confession and start to peel back the layers of this case, I really started to question if Behina did in fact murder Molly on his own. I can't say with 100% certainty that Behina did not commit this crime, but I do stand by my reasoning that other avenues should have been explored to help narrow down any other speculated theories myself and other people may have about this case. One last thing I forgot to mention is I do speculate that certain politicians did use Molly's death to politicize their agenda for Build the Wall campaign, and I think this could have been one big reason as to why this case was closed so quickly after Behina's admission to any involvement with Molly's murder without really exploring other options further. Now with all of that being said, I want to thank everyone for getting this far with me in this episode. And I hope I was able to show you that the story we've been told about Molly Tibbetts might not be exactly what happened to her on July 18th, 2018. I know there will probably be a lot of people that disagree with some of my opinions in this case, but the most important thing is that everyone involved in this case receives the proper justice they deserve, and I really just can't say with 100% certainty that everyone has. As far as case goes, this one was right up there with one of the crazier cases that I've researched thus far. And again, if you're interested in knowing more about this case, make sure you do check out the trial videos on YouTube that the Law & Crime Network has provided for everyone. And for my next episode, I am not quite sure what case I'm going to cover next, though I do have a few lined up. 
I just haven't decided which one I will go with, so please stay tuned to my YouTube and TikTok channel for when I upload a trailer of the next case I decide on. Again, a huge thanks to everyone who continues to support the podcast. And my always friendly reminder, love everyone, but trust no one. I'm your host, Drew V, and you've just heard another episode of Drew Crime.